Let's go back to physics in uh, continuing this story that's going to lead to a mathematician's understanding of the standard model and uh, a bit of a discussion about this Yang Mills $1 million prize problem. So um, we t I've talked a lot about symmetry, and now I want to talk about something that's going to seem like it's different, and that's the idea of a conservation law. Um, in about 200 years, 1700 to 1900, people started realizing how important the idea of a conserved quantity was. So a conserved quantity is something that never changes. Um, another way to say it is that it's some quantity that you can, exp that you can identify in a system that's going to be the same at the start of the experiment and at the end of the experiment. So for example, linear momentum, that is a, a quantity. I'm not going to go into the details. Um, but it's just a basically sort of the amount of oomph you have in some object in terms of that you get, uh, that it gets by virtue of its, its motion along a straight line. So a car has a lot of linear momentum because it's going fast and it's heavy. And if it hits you, part of why that will hurt you and possibly kill you is that it is transferring some of that momentum to you. And if you look at the end point of like a collision of a car and a person or two cars, then if you sum up the momenta, sort of how much oomph they have from their linear motion at the start and the total oomph at the end, it's going to be equal. And you know, part of why you're going to get hurt by that car, inevitably, is that that momentum can't just disappear. It has to, to stay around. And if some of it goes out of the car, it's going to go into you. Angular momentum is uh, a similar thing, but it has to do with rotation that if you are turning a, uh, a merry-go-round and you have a child on a merry-go-round and you get them going really fast, then it's going to be hard to stop that. You're going to have to really exert some force to stop that because it's built up some angular momentum and that momentum wants to stay around. Um, energy is something that's a little more subtle because uh, it looked at first like energy was sometimes conserved and sometimes not. When you hit two billiard balls together, they start out with a bunch of energy of motion, and then they pretty much have the same energy when they when they come apart. But if you have two lumps of clay and you throw them together, it seems like the energy of motion that they had has uh, has disappeared. And uh, people eventually realize that that energy really just changes form and does not ever get destroyed, and it really is conserved. And that became a huge important principle. All these conservation laws became crucial tools for predictions. They're, they became to be seen as bedrock principles of physics, and they were used to test new hypotheses and theories. If some theory said, oh, I think conservation of energy is going to be violated, you'd cast a very, very skeptical eye on that, and that, that is still true today. So an example of, uh, of this is um, this you know, famous kind of executive toy. Now, because I'm not doing the slideshow, let me see if I can put in a slideshow mode to make, make this actually go. It's going to look kind of crappy because it's interacting with the, the video recorder, probably. Uh, but you can see the idea. And so one example, this is an example of conservation of energy, that if you look at how high the balls go, the left-hand ball is going the same height as the right-hand ball because energy is conserved. And the reason this system can go on for such a long time, these guys go on for a long time even in, in reality, um, is that there's very few ways for that energy to go anywhere, and, uh, and the energy is conserved. In the, the mechanical energy is very close to being conserved. Eventually, the deformations of the balls, the noise it makes, the air resistance will, will wear it down, and that energy is going to dissipate out of the system. Um, but one reason, another reason I focus on this one is that if you just, I, there's a couple ways to analyze the system. One would be to realize that when that left hand ball hits the, the second ball as it comes down, it produces a shock wave that then propagates uh, almost invisibly through the other balls and then eventually makes the other ball spring out at the other end. Analyzing the details of that shock wave would be very, very, very complicated and would involve some very sophisticated modeling. But you don't have to do that to predict what's going to happen. With just a few assumptions and the basic laws of conservation of momentum and energy, you can predict what's going to happen in a case like this. And you can predict even counterintuitive things, like the fact that when the first ball comes down, only the, the last one pops off. And you can show that, again, with just a few other mild assumptions, that's pretty much the only thing that could happen that would satisfy conservation of both energy and momentum. And, uh, and so it's a, it's a great example of what conservation laws are super useful for. They allow you to ignore the details.
of what's going on physically. If you could never do that, physics would be, would be almost hopeless. You'd always have to figure out where are all the trillion, trillion, trillion atoms in the universe. What are they always doing at any moment? And analyze all their little collisions with each other. What conservation laws do is they say what's going in, what's going out. Just look at it, sort of a balance sheet, predict what's going on largely on the basis of that, and maybe a few other other assumptions. So let me, uh, yeah, go back to this. This is easier to manipulate with the movie. So, guess what? Conservation laws and symmetries are intimately linked. This is really not a new topic when we bring up conservation laws. Emmy Noether. A uh, famous female mathematician, probably the, the best female mathematician of all time, uh, in 1915 proved a theorem that says, ba given our basic assumptions of how physics works, what's called the Lagrangian formalism, uh, any physical symmetry leads to a conservation law. If your system is symmetric in a certain way, then there's going to be an associated conservation law, and you can even figure out exactly what that quantity is that's going to be conserved. Um, so, for example, the fact that you can do an experiment in one room or the next room or in Santa Fe, New Mexico or in New York City or in Andromeda and you get the same answer. The fact of that symmetry, it turns out that inescapably leads to the conservation of linear momentum. And I'm gonna give you, not going to give you the details of that at all. I, I, I was trying to think how to do that in a general audience context. It's, I, I just think it's too hard. Um, but you can see that there's at least an affinity there. Space translation has something to do with moving along a line, moving it move like north three meters or ten meters or hundred meters. You can see how that might have something to do with linear momentum along that direction. Um, how much oomph you have in the in that direction of motion. Rotation again, the fact that um, a, a physical symmetry has a rotational symmetry will lead inexorably to the fact that that system should conserve angular momentum. And again, there's an affinity there. Rotation and angular momentum has something to do with rotation. The, the real surprising one, I think, from that point of view, is that time translation. What is conserved corresponding to the fact that I can do the experiment now or later and get the same answer? It turns out that is what leads to conservation of energy. And so, in fact, there's an analogy. Space motion is to momentum as time is to energy. And that actually shows up really, really well in special relativity and general relativity. Um, that was a, a fundamental thing that, that shows up automatically in that context as well. And so, in fact, energy has something to do with time. It's a beautiful correspondence. This whole Noether's theorem, the, the correspondence between symmetries and conservation laws, is beautiful. And it also suggests if I'm doing some physics, sometimes what you get experimentally out of the physics is a new conservation law that you didn't expect it suggests that, oh, maybe that's going to come from a symmetry, and, and we'll, we'll see that. Um, so let's, let's say a little bit more about symmetry. Here I'm going to make it a little more complicated because it's crucial to the real kind of symmetry that's at the heart of <coughs> what are called Yang-Mills theories or, or uh, gauge theories. So far I've been talking about global symmetries. Um, they do the same thing. You, what you do is you do the same thing to all parts of your system or your object everywhere. There's also what are called local symmetries. And of an example of that, or a, a, uh, an analogy, I think a pretty good analogy, is time zones. That uh, here, imagine here, here's a totally ahistorical version of the origin of time zones. And you're going to see how ridiculous this is. Um, suppose that long ago, everybody's watch was set to be exactly the same time at, around the world. Now, clearly, if somebody said, oh, you know, let's do daylight savings time for everybody. Let's have everybody in the, un in, in the world set their watches ahead by one hour. Then that wouldn't have been a big problem. You just, everybody sets their watch ahead one hour. Okay, the time has cha changed, but we can still talk to each other. Everybody still has the same time. That's the example of a global symmetry. But time zones are different. Time zones, again, in this very not real history, suppose everybody had the same time on their watches, and then people got really annoyed by the fact that when it was 8 o'clock and time to go to work, uh, it was pitch dark. It was the middle of the night, maybe in some part of the world. And so they said, hey, let's come up with this brilliant idea of time zones. We're going to have everybody set their watch differently, depending on where they live. And then the question is, is that just going to make the concept of time completely meaningless and useless? No, it's not. You just have to be really careful 
if you're talking to somebody, you can't assume they have the same time on their watch. You have to know where they live. So it's trickier to keep track of, but it's possible to keep track of. So it's a very much more sophisticated kind of, of symmetry, but it still works. An example of the uh, subtle trickiness that can happen when you do this kind of thing is the International Dateline. This funny thing that if you go from the United States, for example, and you go west, then uh, suddenly the day you're in changes when you get across the dateline. And, and that has to happen because if you go around the entire world, um, you're g constantly going to be moving time zones in one direction. So, for example, if you are going west, your time zone, you're always gaining an hour, gaining an hour, gaining an hour. Eventually, you get back to where you start, and you can't have gained 24 hours. That would be magic. And so there's got to be some place where it discontinuously breaks, and that's called the dateline. Um, that's an example of what uh, differential geometers call holonomy, that when you have some sort of local quantity and you go around a loop, odd things uh, can often happen. And, and in this case, we just sort of artificially say, no, <laughs> that's, that's not allowed. It doesn't make any sense. And we have to, uh, we have to cut it somewhere to, to prevent that from happening. Turns out the original example of local symmetry in physics is general relativity. And we wouldn't have necessarily said it exactly that way, but Einstein really had this idea in mind in a way. His idea was that in special relativity, he let everybody have their own kind of frame of reference. It was an extension of the idea of Galilean relativity, of the fa idea that physics should be the same on a moving train. And he figured out how to, ac how to accommodate that with the, the rest of physics. But then he said he had a brilliant and just um, revolutionary idea, which is... Um, instead, the, 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 uh, the special relativity theory, it's called special because, well, roughly because um, you had to use certain very special frames of reference. You could have, everybody could have different ones, but they had to come from a very special class. And um, in general relativity, it posited the principle of general covariance, which is that everybody has bizarre, complicated, very different frames of reference, coordinate systems, ways to basically assign mathematics numbers to the universe or their own little bit of the universe and he said we've got to have a way we want to have a physics a way to write down physics that's going to be the same in every coordinate system that gives you the same answers and uh you're gonna it, you're gonna have to carefully relate two different descriptions of the world but you you turns out that's possible the really amazing thing is that just that requirement that everybody will be allowed to work in their own way and that they have to relate to each other and give the same physics, it automatically leads to something that looks like a force. And it's, it's, really, it's really better to even think of it not even as a force. It's, as, as you know, pro most people watching this will, will have heard of, it's curvature of space and time. That it turns out that uh, the intrinsic nature of how space and time are shaped makes things come together in a way that looks like things are ac uh, acting on each other by forces. But it's actually much more fundamental than that. And a way to say this is that it just comes from a local symmetry principle. Um, another consequence of Einstein's idea, he's got this local symmetry principle, which is a, a hugely flexible kind of symmetry. Um, that can be combined with Noether's theorem. Noether says any kind of symmetry, even at this fancy kind of local symmetry, where we're doing much more complicated kinds of transformations that depend on what point you are in space and in time, um, Noether's theorem applies to that, and it gives a local form of the conservation of energy and momentum. Remember what I said was a conservation law before was something that says there's a number at the start that attaches to your whole system, like the total energy of the system, and then a number at the end and those numbers should be the same? Well, this form is much fancier. You get what's, what you could call a flow of energy and momentum throughout the universe. And you can keep track. The, the reason that it's, it, the total is the same is that it always flows around but is never created or destroyed. So here I'm just, this is actually a wind chart for the United States, but I'm just trying to give the, the vague idea of the flow of something through space. And so energy and momentum are always flowing through space and time. Right now, right through your body, they are flowing through space and time. Um, and they can never be created or destroyed. And that is a much more sophisticated, powerful principle of conservation that allows you to keep track not only of the total amount, but sort of where it is at any, at any point. And um, it turns out that these principles, just these basic symmetry principles, lead to much of the content of the theory. 
it doesn't allow you to exactly predict the equations or exactly solve anything, but it tells you a heck of a lot about what has to be true about um, the theory. In this, in this case, the theory of gravitation that general relativity provides. Okay, I want to I check my timing here. Um, okay, in fact, so let, let me, one more slide will be a good place to stop. Um, in fact, if you have any kind of local symmetry, and we'll see different ones uh, soon in a, in a later part, it gives you what's called a conserved current. It's a flow of some sort of stuff in the universe that it's never created or destroyed. Here's another picture of flowing. This is a picture of ocean currents. And so this is the fact that water flows around, but it's never created or destroyed. Um, and the prediction that you're going to get from any theory with some sort of local symmetry where everybody can adjust some sort of parameter independently of each other is that there's going to be some sort of stuff that's never created or destroyed, just moves around. It's a very useful and concrete prediction. And um, the sort of stuff that it, it creates, it predicts, might have been something you never even thought of or noticed. It might be something that's rather hard to describe physically. It might not be pictured exactly as the flow of water through the ocean. But it's a, it's a very, very useful prediction. And so again, Nutter's theorem and the idea of symmetry is uh, hugely, hugely powerful.